Brothers and sisters, it's an honor and a privilege to be with you here this evening. And in fact, it is absolutely great because I've never been to Devon. So this has provided an opportunity for me to come down to Devon and have a look at this beautiful place and meet with yourselves as well. So, and would you believe it? I brought the Scottish weather with me as well. <laughs> if, you, if you believe that, you believe anything. We get all four seasons in one day, but it's really nice to have this lovely weather. All right, so I'm going to be talking about Sikhs. Uh, uh, the word Sikh itself means learner. So in fact, we're all Sikhs because we are always learning all the time. From the moment that we are born uh, to the day we pass on, from this earth, we are always learning. So the word seek means learner. Um, so I just want you to ask before I start, how many of you know anything about the Sikh religion? Well, obviously the Sikhs do, so <laughs> don't bother putting your hand up. <laughs> but the others I'm talking about, uh, some of you do, some of you do, yeah. You have, the, you have some sort of concept of the, of the religion as well. Um, I'm a retired teacher, so I'm not going to be talking all the time. I shall be asking you some questions as well, you know, like teachers do anyway. So can anyone tell me um, how old is the Sikh religion and the Sikh uh, you need to... Shh. 500 years. 500 years, just over 550 years. Right, so um, here we go, we start off. Right, so the Sikh dharam or religion uh, began with the birth of Guru Nanak in uh, 1469. And Guru Nanak was born in Nankara Sahib, which is now part of Pakistan after uh, the um, sectioning of uh, India in 1947. And uh, there's a lot of misconception about the word Guru itself. Guru, as we take it in the, the Sikh religion, means someone who takes you from darkness, from ignorance, to enlightenment. Now, nowadays, you have quite a lot of these, oh, this person is a guru of um, the gym, or the life coach, or etc., etc. You've got plenty of gurus who are going around. But in the Sikh religion, it means a special messenger from God. So, the Sikh religion is unique in the fact that we didn't have just one prophet, but we had nine successive human gurus. And, uh, and the religion itself developed over 239 years. So that is something quite unique. After the 10th guru, Guru Gobind Singh Ji, passed, he said that no, there will be no more human gurus. After me, you will consider the scriptures as your eternal guru. So the scriptures are now known as the Guru Granth Sahib Ji, and you will find the holy six scriptures in every Gurdwara around the world. The Guru Granth Sahib uh, not only contains the writings of the Sikh Gurus, but also the writings of Hindu and Muslim saints. So you could really call it an interfaith scripture where prominence was given to uh, <coughs> people of God who thought, who thought about the essence of religion as a religion should be lived out in daily life. And I will explain a little bit more after that as well. So let's just talk about what was happening in India in the 15th century and why I've put the title uh, as six being challengers and reformers. India in the 15th century was being ruled and had been ruled for centuries by the Mughals. The Mughals were oppressing all of the population, forcibly trying to convert them to Islam. The, uh, so you had the political oppression you also had oppression from the caste system, where the high caste priests, the Brahmins, oppressed the lower castes as well. In fact, the lower castes were not even allowed to listen to scriptures. 
They were not allowed to sit and eat with other people. They were not allowed to really um, take part in society because they were thought that because they were of a low caste that they should be shunned. So you had the political oppression from uh, the Mughal rulers who were oppressing everyone. And then you had the religious oppression from the high caste Brahmins or the high caste priests who were oppressing the masses. And obviously when that happens, when there's a lot of um, pain and suffering from humanity, God sends someone. And at that time, God sent Guru Nanak. <clears throat> Guru Nanak challenged the tyranny of um, the Mughal rulers. He challenged the meaningless rituals and rites that were taking place. He challenged the treatment of women. You can imagine in the 15th century, everywhere around the world, not just in the East, everywhere around the world, women were treated as second-class citizens. They weren't even allowed to um, be educated. They weren't <coughs> able to take part in society fully. So he, he challenged all that at his time, and also especially the rigid caste system that was in place. So he started to bring about a social and spiritual regeneration. So the first thing that as a messenger of God, first thing he said was to recognize that there is only one God. We may all have different pathways to God, but remember that there is only one God. And the light, the divine light is present in you and in you and in me as well. And to recognize that divine light within the other and yourself. He wanted to make it clear that cre the creator and creation are one. That all of creation is a man manifestation of God as well. But how do we begin to see that manifestation, that God is in everything and everywhere. And this is the logo that we have. Our Holy Scriptures, the Guru Granth Sahib, begins with Ik Ankar. The numeral, <coughs> that's a numeral, one in, in Punjabi. And the rest of it is Ankar, that there is only one God. Make no mistake, there is only one God. Christian God is not any different from the Muslim God or the Sikh God. There is only one God and we have different ways of perceiving that God. And all is God's creation. When the divine call came to Guru Nanak to spread the message from God, the first thing that he said was that there is no Hindu or Muslim. Now, India at that time, <laughs> all the people were either Hindus or Muslims, okay? Because the Sikh faith was just, the religion was just beginning to start with the advent of Guru Nanak. So, meaning that there shouldn't be any distinction between people. These are all man-made labels that we have. <coughs> In the end, it depends on what deeds that you do while you were here on this earth, not the man-made labels that we have here. His theology was simple in that we're all created equal by the one true creator and no religion can claim monopoly on God. Anyone could aspire to have union with God regardless of their caste, religion or gender. Now at that time, because the Brahmins had, the high priests had a monopoly on religion. If you wanted a marriage ceremony to take place, you had to go through the Brahmins. If you wanted a funeral rite, you had to go through the Brahmins. If there was a child born and you wanted the child blessed, you had to go through the Brahmins. 
So everything dependent on going through uh, someone else. You couldn't do it yourself. And Guru Nanak Dev Ji challenged that because every person has the right to have salvation, to be able to uh, read their scriptures, to be able to pray when they want and how they want and not just have to go to a priest to have all these ceremonies um, uh, take place. So therefore, in the Sikh religion, we don't have a priesthood. We have someone who will um, uh, look after the Guru Granth Sahib in the Gurdwara and we, do, we tend to call uh, our place of worship a Gurudwara, which is the correct term, the house of God or the doorway to the Guru, um, not a Sikh temple. So we're going away from that terminology. So if you, if you, um, uh, when you're sort of uh, communicating with others, please try and use the correct terminology to say it's the Gurudwara, it's the Sikh place of worship and not the Sikh temple. The temple part came about because ages ago people uh, knew that a temple meant a place of worship. So I think that's why Sikhs began and right at the beginning in the 50s and 60s when the new when the first gurdwaras were being formed in the uk they use the word temple so please use the word gurudwara so guru nanak said that god will not ask um, man of what religion he or she is he will ask what deeds have you done while you have been on this earth The Guru wanted to remove these man-made boundaries because he said that there's light in all. God's light is in all. In all creation dwell, dwells the divine light. It is the light of the Creator Himself. So Guru Nanak said that God not, not only was here, but God is everywhere and in every form. And therefore we have a responsibility <coughs> towards creation. We have a responsibility towards animals. We have a responsibility to protect the earth. Because we happen to be at the apex of um, the system, animal, vegetables, and we have the ability to think as to what is right and wrong. And therefore, we have a responsibility to all other living, uh, animate and inanimate, uh, objects on this earth. Now the Guru through dialogue and practical action showed people the true path because what he found that um, people were just doing things for the sake <coughs> of doing them because it was a ritual. The true essence of uh, how they should be praying to God or what they should be doing uh, was not taking place. Now when um, one of the priests said, um, one of the Qasis, the Muslim priests said to Guru Nanak, when he said there is no Hindu or Muslim, he said, well, there might not be any Hindus, but there are certainly Muslims here. And he said, well, will you come and pray with us in, in the mosque? And Guru Nanak said, yes, I'll come and pray with you. So the, the Qasis said the prayers and Guru Nanak just stood there and didn't say anything. And once the prayers had finished, the, uh, uh, the, the Muslim said to Guru Nanak, you were not praying, you didn't take part in the prayer. Guru Nanak said, how could I take part in the prayer when you were thinking about the new foal that has just uh, been born, that it might uh, fall into the well, and the governor over there was thinking about buying horses from Kabul said you were not praying you were acting as if you were praying it was a ritual of prayer the true prayer is the connection to god when you are praying and not just sitting there with folded hands or bowing down but thinking about others now that is one thing that Sikhs are, are, are meant to do is to have the connection with god at all times i mean i might be standing here and talking to you but my connection my mind should be connected with the Creator, with God. I should be saying the mantra, Vaibhu, Vaibhu, Vaibhu all the time. 
which means God is wonderful. God is wonderful. Look at all the universe and all the things that God has created, all the universes and things. Can we, can we even create a little thing? Uh, with the COVID-19 virus, I don't think we'd be able to create that, but God created that for some reason. Who knows what mistakes we have made on this earth. But prayer should not be a ritual. It should be a connection to God. And not just being standing there as a, a body in prayer. Another way that he, he, he challenged people by um, getting them to question the rituals that they were doing. For example, once he was, he, Guru Nanak actually had four great journeys. He went south, north, south, east, west. And along those journeys, he had dialogue with people. And that's why I got in, involved with interfaith dialogue. Because when Guru Nanak traveled, he traveled with a, a Muslim and a Hindu as well, by Balaji and by Mundanaji. And so if, if Guru Nanak Ji was able to um, have dialogue and have companions who were from different faiths, then I as a Sikh in this day and age should be doing the same thing. Because that's the, the role model that they set for me. And so that is one of the reasons I am involved in interfaith work because it's there. It, the practical applications of interfaith are embedded within the Sikh religion. But we have to realize it and we have to act upon that as well. So Guru Nanak challenged these rituals that people are, have been doing for centuries. Um, and I'm sure we do the same as well because we've been told in our, in our faiths, oh, you do this because you have to, it's been done for centuries. But why? Very few of us ask, why are we doing that? What is the connection that we have that will be created with God by doing this ritual? You do need rituals. You do need certain rituals to, uh, um, to connect with God, but it has to be the correct type of ritual, not just for the sake of doing it. I mean, for example, um, in India, the, the Hindus at that time um, used to pray to their ancestors, and they used to go to a place called Hardwar in the Ganges. And in order to pray to their ancestors, they used to sort of stand in the Ganges and um, take uh, sort of water and throw it towards the sun, towards the east. Now what Guru Nanak Dev Ji said, I mean, if you just talk to a person, they're not going to change their mind, right? So you have to somehow do it practically. So what they did, they went into the Ganges, face the west, and starting, starting uh, throwing water towards the west. And the people around Guru Nanak thought, he doesn't know. We'll just go and say to him, look, you're doing it the wrong way. You should be doing it towards the east, you know, not the west. Um, uh, so Guru Nanak, said, Guru Nanak said, why are you doing it uh, towards, why are you throwing water, you know, to, towards the sun? Oh, we're letting the water reach the sun and our ancestors. So Guru Nanak didn't say anything. He just kept on so spraying water towards the west. And the people said, no, no, you're doing it wrong. Why are you doing it to the west? No, Guru Nanak said, well, I've been away from my fields in the west for a long, for a long time. So I'm just uh, throwing the water that way so it reaches my fields so that the crops don't die. <laughs> and the people said, can you not see that the water that you're throwing into the, towards the west is just going into the Ganges? And then Guru Nanak said, well, can you not see that the water that you're throwing is also going into the Ganges? It's not reaching your ancestors. So then they saw that the ritual that they were doing, why were they doing it? So Guru Nanak Dev Ji had dialogue with them as well. So instead of just saying, you're wrong, he challenged that ritual that they were doing, okay? And brought them back to the essence of, of religion. One last story. Uh, um, Guru Nanak, as I said, traveled widely. He even went to Mecca. <coughs> I mean, at that time, there were no restrictions for any other people to go to Mecca, but nowadays, there's only Muslims who can go. And he was tired with his companion. He lay down and went to sleep. 
but his feet were uh, pointing towards Mecca, the Kaaba. And uh, one Muslim came along because you're not supposed to uh, point your feet towards the Kaaba because God is there, so you don't point your feet towards that. So he was really angry and said, don't you know you're not supposed to point your feet towards uh, the Kaaba? And Gunali said, well, please point my feet, move my feet to in the direction where the Kaaba is not. So the Muslim moved uh, Gunali's feet and the Kaaba moved around and he moved to Gunali's feet again and the Kaaba moved around and he kept on doing that and every time wherever Gunali's feet were pointing, the Kaaba was there. So <laughs> eventually the Muslim just fell down at Gunali's feet and said, well, I don't understand what is happening. And the Guru said, God is everywhere, not just in a particular place. God surrounds us everywhere. So that's just a couple of stories. So what Guru Nanak advocated was that be truthful, but also live a truthful life, which is much more important than just saying the truth. And I think with the recent events that we've been hearing on the news, uh, yes, I think it's extremely important to be to lead a truthful life. So, uh, Sikhs are encouraged to lead a truthful life of commitment amongst the day-to-day -day responsibilities of family life. Now, Guru Nanak said that live, living within a family life is very important because in India um, at that time. A lot of men used to go off into uh, the mountains to meditate and to pray and to obtain salvation for, uh, for themselves. But what about their families? <laughs> Who's going to be helping them? So Gurnanik said, you must live in a family life. You must take on the responsibility of a family life, but also be connected to God at all times. You're supposed to be like a lotus flower in a muddy pond, the roots of the lotus flower are in the mud and the dirt, but the flower itself is above it. So you're supposed to be that flower at the top. You, you do your day-to-day -day responsibilities, but you also remain above all that responsibility, but you have that connection to God at all times. Because if you have that connection to God, that you are accountable for your actions. You know, you yourself know what is right and wrong. And if you are accountable to God, then your actions will stay truthful as well. So you lead, in fact, th these, these kind of things have internal checks if you are living uh, a God-conscious life. Because you know that God is everywhere. God is watching. So you watch what you do. So his guidance for living a truthful life, and what you could say these are our pillars, is Nam Jokho. Pray and meditate upon God's name. Remember God with every breath and realize his presence uh, constantly. And whilst, while you're remembering God, earn, you must earn an honest living. So when you're, how, however you're earning your living, whether it's uh, as, uh, as a labourer, as a doctor, as a, any teacher, etc., remember God at all times. And therefore work becomes worship. I mean, I used to explain, because I was a teacher, I used to explain to the children when I was explaining that, how can you, um, you know, remember God at the same time? And I used to say, well, you're... Well, how many of you, when you're sitting in my class, are thinking, oh, I wonder what program's on telly tonight. Oh, I've got to go to gym or I've got to go to games and things. Their mind is somewhere else, but their body is in my classroom. So it's the same sort of thing. When you're um, uh, working, your mind should be in connection with God. Whatever you earn from your work, you share with others. You exercise benevolence, and ideally we need to relinquish everything to God. A Sikh is supposed to give a tenth of their income, or their time, or their mind, or their body, to uh, uh, charitable courses, to serving humanity. And when you serve, 
It's supposed to be selfless service without any thought of reward. It's not, it's not supposed to be, oh, look at me, I'm here in the, in the church or anywhere else, 24 hours a day doing this, or I want to get to heaven. Your service here is supposed to be without any thought of reward. It's there to help humanity. And equality, the 10th Guru, Guru Nanak Devji said, it, and all the other Gurus, that uh, recognize all human beings as one, the human race as one, and respecting all religions. Because God, in, in his wisdom, um, revealed himself to different people at different times. And therefore, all of his revelations should be treated with the utmost respect and dignity. How am I doing for time? Okay. I think we have, yeah, maybe another um, 10, 15 minutes. Right, so the very existence of the Sikh religion is based on challenging the inequality in society, the exploitation of the poor, and the mar marginalized by the religious and political establishments, and protecting the weak and the oppressed. So the Guru started various institutions um, where they wanted society to be equal. Okay. So, uh, Sangha, which means that the Gurus invited everyone to pray together. And Bhangat, before having audience with the Gurus, every person wore, had to sit together and eat before they could have an audience. So that was called Bhangat. Now, at that time, that was a very <coughs> radical um, uh, is, uh, what could you, a very radical reform because nobody sat together. The high priest did not sit with the lower class. Um, young and old might have sat together, but uh, women definitely didn't sit. But to get everybody to sit together on the same level, that was a practical way of establishing <coughs> equality. And so the gurus, all the gurus did that. They used practical methods to get rid of these inequalities in society. One of the things that Guru Nanak Dev Ji uh, helped with very much, and you probably, if you've been to the Gurdwara, in, um, uh, is the concept of hunger. Because there are always the poor who need feeding. And I think in all our religions, we all, we all go out of our way to help the poor and the sick. And Guru Nanak Deji started the concept of langar. Now, it was started quite in a, in a very um, uh, spiritual way. When Guru Nanak was young, he, he was born into a family where there were business. His father was a businessman. So he gave his uh, son 20 rupees to go and make a profit. So Guru Nanak went with a companion and uh, he saw on his way, he saw some uh, holy men who were hungry and tired and needed clothes as well. So he used that 20 rupees to feed them and clothe them. And when he went back home to his father, his father said, well, how much profit did you make? You know, as you would expect in, in business. He said, I made a lot of profit, wonderful amount of profit. And he said, how much? He said, well, I used the 20 rupees to feed some holy men, feed and clothe them. And you can imagine that the Guru's father wasn't very pleased. Uh, but then Guru Nanak said, but that is true business. Using what you have to help the poor and to feed the poor. And therefore, the concept of langar was started in, in Gurdwara's. It's a free community kitchen. It's a vegetarian meal, which is provided for all. And I can tell you that during COVID, uh, and even now, uh, a lot of people from all communities come. So many of the Gurdwaras, they made langar in, in, uh, in the kitchens and then went out in, uh, in bands to give people food. So with langar, everyone sits side by side and eats. So it gets rid of that inequality. And even Emperor Ak Akbar, had to, in the time of Guru Amr Das Ji, had to sit with everyone else, all the common people, and eat uh, the meal before he could have audience with the third guru. 
So a, a couple of quotes, the Lord himself gives in charity to the whole world, to all beings and creatures which he created. All mortal beings share your wealth, food, and spend together. By sharing wealth, it will not diminish, but continue to flourish and increase. The more you give, the more you receive. You don't know where you get it from, but it comes. He Good night, Devji. Then the third thing was, he challenged the status of women. Um, at that time, women obviously weren't educated. They couldn't read any of the scriptures. Uh, they were considered lowest of the low. They were a hindrance to salvation. But Guru Nanak Dev Ji said, well, it is by women that we are conceived and from them that we are born. It is a women we befriend and it is they who keep the race going. It is with them that we are established in society. Why should she be called inferior when she gives birth to humankind? And there are numerous, numerous verses in the Guru Granth Sahib which uh, state that, you know, women, which exalt the status of women. But if we have a look at what's happening today, especially with COVID in all faiths, in all societies around the world, there has been so much domestic violence against women. What is it that we are teaching our young children about how to treat um, females within society and I think as interfaith forums we need to do that more we need to challenge these uh, perceptions that uh, have been have been rooted in society for centuries and we've still got a long way to come we we, we feel that you know in the west that we've equality, we've got equality but if you have a look at the gender pay gap, if you have a look at the domestic violence figures, if you have a look at all sorts of other uh, facts and figures, it, it is horrendous. So as people of faith, we need to build that up, that women, need, their status needs to be exalted. Because I tell you, without women, none of you would be here. <laughs> none of you would be here. And neither the prophets would, have, would, not, uh, would not be here either. So my journey, well I've tried to implement all the things that the, the gurus have uh, challenged and tried to inform society. So obviously I'm learning all the time as a Sikh, um, I haven't got great knowledge, I try and impart as much as I can. But when I was younger, um, when I had my children, what we did in the 90s, early 90s, I started um, uh, Nam Simran classes which are teaching uh, children how to read the first morning prayer and how to meditate and um, uh, tell them basically about how to connect with God and the, uh, the um, little bit about the history of, of the Sikh religion as well. And it started off with me doing exhibitions for school, uh, getting the wider community involved, telling them about the Sikh faith, but also learning about uh, learning about others because Guru Nanak did so much with other other religions and in fact the if you know that the Golden Temple or the Harmandir Sahib in Amritsar the foundation stone was laid by Sant Mia Mir uh, at the request of the Guru so um, the fifth Guru he la uh, they laid the foundation stone down so it didn't matter whether the man-made label of this person is a Muslim or a Hindu or a Christian, person of God laid down the foundation stone. And that aspect of it, I've tried to do various um, events. Um, for example, in 1999, we had a big exhibition at Kelvin Grove Art Galleries, which over four months, 200 and uh, a quarter of a million people saw the exhibition. We had the exhibition was actually in the form of big banners, and uh, we had the model of Herman Sar, which we uh, gifted to Glasgow City Councils. But the Basaki exhibition, I want to ask you: How do you know? How can you tell that a person is a Sikh? The Koko or Singh. The Koko or Singh, but if by looking at them. How do you know a person is sick? Turban. The turban is the, the, the star or the turban is the identifying um, uh, 
sort of uniform. It's like a uniform, isn't it? You will know, I know a lot of Muslims now wear turbans as well, but before it was the Sikhs who were wearing turbans. And this, this Vasaki is the festival where, or, or is the um, religious festival where Sikhs were given their spiritual and physical identity by the 10th Guru. And the, uh, forming what we call the Brotherhood of the Khalsa, which is the community of initiated Sikhs. Now, if you, if, if you are a Sikh, the, actually the Khalsa was there to protect others. It was um, the weak and the oppressed couldn't actually uh, fight for themselves. They didn't have the ability to do that. So Guru Gobind Singh Ji formed the Khalsa to protect those who could not protect themselves. And the Khalsa was created in 1699. He created a, a community of saint soldiers, guardians to protect all, who were dedicated to selfless service and self-sacrifice for the good of others. And he called them the Khalsa Akal Purukki Forge, which means the Khalsa is a God's, God's army. He said, he declared that initiated six must, again, use the um, practical way of ensuring that there was equality, that they should share uh, Amrit, which is holy water, from the same vessel, uh, have one religious name, as you said, Singh or Kaur, because in the olden days, and probably here as well in the West, you could tell by your surname what job you did. Right? For example, I'm sure Smith, there must have been blacksmiths in, in, in the olden days. But in, in India at that time, they could tell what caste you were from by your surname. So Guru Gobind Singh Ji said, if you are an initiated Sikh, you, if you're a man, you will be called Singh, which means lion. If you're a woman, uh, you'll be called Kaur, which is princess. So that gets rid of that uh, inequality because of names. And he said that you have to keep five articles of faith, whether you're a man or a woman. And I'm sure you probably have heard that the five articles of faith are commonly known as the five Ks. Gesh, which is uncut hair, and uh, the uncut hair is covered by men with a star, although a lot of women are wearing uh, turbans or the star <coughs> as well. Hair is a God-given gift. If you cut your hair, you are not abiding by the will of God. And I'm sure you all, some of you know the story of Samson and Delilah as well. The hair keeps in the spirituality, the prayer gives strength as well. So that's why you, if you cut your hair, you're going against the will of God. So therefore, as an initiated or a baptized Sikh, you're required to have uncut hair. And if you've got hair which is long, you need something to keep it neat and tidy. And so you have a, a wooden comb. And so it doesn't matter where you are, whether you're in, you were in the olden days, centuries ago, you were in the battlefield, you were able to keep your hair neat and tidy. You wear a, a kara, whether you're a man or a woman, a steel bangle, which shows actually the eternity of God. God goes on forever. But, um, and if you're thinking of doing anything wrong, it reminds you, no, don't do anything wrong. You're a Sikh. Uh, at the karpan, which is a small sword that all baptized initiated Sikhs keep. And it is actually a spiritual limb. It, it, it's used in self-defense and to protect others. Kirpa means to bestow dignity and honor. And, and therefore, it has never <coughs> been used in an offensive manner. It's always in self-defense and to protect the weak. <coughs> Kashara, which is a special pair of shorts that everyone is required to wear because if you are in a battlefield somewhere, you want to be protected, it's for chastity and modesty as well. So this is, so I explained a little bit about Visaki and the spiritual significance and why Sikhs have got their, their identity. So just a few pictures of when we were giving over the um, uh, gifting the Harmandar Sahib. There were exhibitions for schools, and we had the first Gatka display in 1999, which is a Sikh martial art. I don't know whether, perhaps you can ask, you can get one of the uh, Gatka display teams from um, 
from London to come down here and uh, have it at Vasaki or some, some of the other festivals perhaps. Then in 2006, we had a, a special Sikh religious uh, educational interfaith event, which went on for four days. And there were various conferences, there were chaplaincy uh, events. Um, there was a, a special conference where we had people, um, religious leaders from Jerusalem coming over and discussing how to take peace forward in Jerusalem. We also had the spiritual educational zone and we were actually, we were one of the first ones to think about um, protecting the earth in 2006. Uh, so just, you can ask, uh, and Bhai Sab Mohinder Singh is a, a, a spiritual uh, leader in Birmingham. Uh, so if you ever go to Birmingham, please go to Sava Road and uh, do visit the Gurdwara there. They have a lot of different projects. They've got Nishkam schools, they've got Nishkam Civic Association. So do go there and have a look. We've got a permanent, the exhibition that we used in 1999, it was uh, the Gurdwaras in Glasgow were just tenements and things which were converted from um, uh, uh, buildings which were there before. But in uh, 2013 and 2016, we had the first purpose-built Gurdwaras. And uh, the, the one in 2016, we've got the permanent exhibition there and a lot of the materials that were made in 1999 are displayed there and this is just showing the various panels and things which the panels explain to people what i wanted was actually i made the exhibition so i don't want to go on about it but it took over two years to make the exhibition to actually write the material to get the various verses from the guru Granth side to have them translated and also the transliteration of it as well. So if you ever go to Glasgow, mm -hmm. please go and see the exhibition. It's a way of informing our own children, but it's also a way of informing other communities who come uh, to the Gurdwara as well. And if anybody wants this exhibition as a PDF, it's available from me. At the opening of uh, the Gurdwara, you can see the Gurdwara there in the middle. We had lots and lots of, we invited all the religious leaders and obviously the Guru Granth Sahib mm -hmm. was being placed in, a, in the Gurudwara. <coughs> and that leads, us, leads me on to my interfaith work that I do. Um, I thought it's very important to bring communities together. And in two, uh, 1999, 2002 to 2004, we, uh, I was the chair of Scottish Interfaith Council, which is now known as Interfaith Scotland. Uh, we initiated uh, Interfaith Week. And in 2009, England and Wales took forward Interfaith Week. And I'm sure you do things during Interfaith Week. But before 2009, there wasn't Interfaith Week. So that was one way our initial thoughts were to get uh, religious leaders and members of parliament and council councillors to visit places of worship and to learn about others as well. But to have that have that one-to-one -one conversations, like I hope I'll have time with you here. Um, uh, apart from that, from, from those beginnings, I came onto the UK Interfaith Network Executive Committee, and then I was asked to form the European uh, Women of Faith Network for uh, Religious for Peace, which is an international interfaith organization, which works in over 91 countries with a senior uh, council of world religious leaders plus a Global Women of Faith Network, which is their photo there, and a Global Interfaith Youth Network. But we also have continental ones as well, and I, I chair the UK Women of Faith Network. <coughs> so, um, just a little bit about, you know, why. Here's the facts for women. Uh, 774 million illiterate adults, two-thirds are women. Share of illiterate, uh, of illiterate women has not changed for the past 20 years. So what are we doing wrong? Among the world's uh, 123 million illiterate, illiterate youth, 76 million are female. So if they're not be going to be able to read and write, how are they going to learn about their faith? It will depend on men telling them what is in their scriptures. And sometimes what they are told is not correct. 
So uh, it's always been uh, his story from history and it's never her story. So what we're trying to do is trying to change uh, the, the, the concept so that, so that women actually look at their scriptures and see what is written about them in their scriptures. Um, average uh, men are paid more, we know that. Uh, there's not a single country where women are paid as much as men. The global pay gap between men and women will take 202 years <laughs> to close. So we're not going to be around when that happens, so we need to do something right now. And who better than all of us together? You know, that's why we have these networks. That's why we have you know, interfaith groups as well, so that our voices can be heard at a, you know, together it will be heard more than a single community trying to communicate with the political powers or the religious powers. And the reason why we have women of faith networks is because uh, most of the religious leaders are men. And so women's voices is not being heard at the level that it should be. But you, if you have a network which is made up of faith-based and interfaith-based women's organizations, your voice is going to be uh, heard a lot more. And also violence against women. We know what's happening. Uh, here are some just figures, the facts that I've got. So the network uh, that I chair, we, uh, we have a call restoring dignity to address the different forms of violence um, against women. And uh, we produced uh, an exhibition which is called The Dignity of Women Scripture Reflections. Uh, this is to empower women, uh, to promote interfaith dialogue, and to challenge men. And we have this, I have this booklet here as well, which has got all the exhibition uh, materials in it. So if uh, anybody wishes to have the, if you wish to have the exhibition down here, it can be sent down as well. So that's one of the ways practically to see uh, how we can uh, improve the status of women through religious scriptures. Protecting the earth, well, oh, earth, we always call the earth a mother earth. <laughs> and uh, our mother earth we need to protect. So one of the projects that we're taking forward is Let Earth Breathe, Plant Trees, uh, whereby we ask individuals, families, schools, places of worship, businesses, etc., councils to symbolically plant a tree of peace, but also, therefore, by educating others on um, uh, the impact that they are having on the atmosphere. I mean, I, I don't know how much impact all these bombs and things are having on the atmosphere. We only have, uh, it's 22, we only have eight years left. And I was at COP26, we only have eight years left to make a difference. So unless we actually work together to help the environment, there's not gonna be much of the world left. Half of it will be underwater. We create the visibility of the leadership role of women of faith. So we talk, over, I mean, we've been doing that through Zoom. And I have been very blessed in all my time doing all this interfaith work. I've managed, I've been blessed to meet the Dalai Lama, the Pope, uh, Abhi Janki, who, is a spirit, who was the spiritual leader of uh, the Brahma Kumaris, and numerous, countless other um, religious leaders. I mean, it's it's been, an honor and a privilege and also I managed to come down to Devon as well to meet all of you. <laughs> so it's been a... and I've spoken at the Parliament of the uh, actually at the Parliament of World Religions as well as the uh, Religious for Peace World Assembly in Vienna and the last one we just had in Germany as well and that's the exhibition at the back there. Uh, events in uh, Glasgow COP26 very very heavily involved in COP26 uh, the Global Women of Faith Network for the first time issued uh, a statement on the environment which I was able to give to um, His Royal Highness Prince Charles. And we uh, welcomed pilgrims from all over the world to the Gurdwara as well. And obviously there was about 100,000 people at the, the Climate March, the Climate Justice March uh, in, in Glasgow. It was a very wet day, horrible, horrible. We all got wet. And the final word, well, finally, brothers and sisters, you know, we're on this earth for a, a very short amount of time in the time scale of the universe. 
So we are all spiritual travellers who've been sent here to gather spiritual wealth. Whether we're here for 50 years, 60, 70, 80 or 90 years, it's a very, very short amount of time. So if we can even help one person through our lifetime, then it has been worth coming to this earth as a human.